Today I'm going to look at picket slide rules. On the left you see are the slide rules that have a kind of yellow color. Let me turn this off and you might see that a little better. They're not in chronological order, they are in order by model number. This is a, a Model 3. This is a 1010, so 1010T. So you can see <coughs> that the model numbers really don't give you a chronology. In fact, in a second, I'll take a look at the slide rule chronology. But I kind of wanted to give you an idea. These are sort of the best examples of each of these models that I have in, in my uh, quite limited collection. So uh, if you are interested in looking at a wider selection of uh, picket rules, you can go to the International Slide Rule Museum on the web and find a, an awful lot of information about them. I'm not going to try to show you how to use these slide rules. I'm just going to talk about the history of uh, Pickett. They were a latecomer to the slide rule field. They uh, began in, I think they actually started business in 44, but I don't think they really sold any slide rules until 1945. They were unique in one respect. They made slide rules out of metal. Now most of the slide rules that they sold were made out of aluminum, but early in the company's history they used magnesium, and there are two examples of the magnesium rules over here, this one and this one. I will go into each of these uh, individually in a minute and kind of talk about the, uh, the, the history and the chronology uh, more in a, uh, in a historical context. Uh, but before we do that, let's take a quick look at a, uh, a chart of Pickett and a little bit about how it developed over the years. This chronology shows a number of things. This is the year, and you'll notice that it runs from 1945 to 1975. By 75, Pickett was, or, and slide rules in general, were pretty much uh, in the past. People weren't buying new slide rules. Instead, they were buying electronic calculators. At the top are the various picket trademarks uh, or logos, you might call them. And these appear on slide rules. And these are the approximate time periods when, the, uh, when they use that particular logo that's shown down here. Uh, I... The, the earliest one that I have is this logo. I don't think I've got anything with this logo on it. I think this predates slide rules. But they have divided this up into what they call eight periods. But all of this is post-war. The alloy is the, the metal, the base metal that they built the rule out of. And on the left is magnesium and aluminum is, is the next. You see that from about 1950 uh, on, they only built aluminum slide rules. They stopped using magnesium. For, for one reason, it corrodes very badly. And I have two magnesium slide rules, and both of them require periodic maintenance to keep the, uh, the, the corrosion down. Early on, they used to groove the rails, and later they grooved the slide. The, in about 1953 or so, they began using tension springs in the slides to keep the rule, the, the slide, from falling out the end. That was, a, that was a common complaint with these early slide rules is, if you had them loose enough to slide easily, then the slide would sometimes just fall out the end. Uh, these are, are of less interest, uh, stator posts, cursor bars, and so on. So let's take a look at a list of the rules we're going to talk about.
There are 10 slide rules in all. They're represented here. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so that we can see the printing a little better. They vary from a Model 3, which is one of the uh, series from which the Model 4 and the N4 were developed. These are the large, wide slide rules that you saw first. We're going to also look at the and I should point out that if it has an N in front of it, that means that it's a what Pickett regarded as a new rule, which means it's the, the latter part of their uh, of their slide rule production. Uh, I think they started using the N around 1960. At any rate, the they used various names, and as we'll see, one of the things that uh, Pickett did was the log-log scales were somewhat unusual. We'll talk about that a little bit. If you want more of this, uh, more in-depth treatment, go to Professor Herning's uh, website. I mentioned it in a previous video. and uh, But they called, Pickett that is, called their log-log scales dual base because unlike most slide rules that used a log uh, 10, log E format, Pickett used log 10, log 10 format. And like I say, I'll let you uh, go to Professor Herning's site for a little more explanation of that, but that was what they called dual base. The, uh, because these are not in chronological order, they're in order of model number, the uh, and, and I kind of picked this out of a, a, a spreadsheet that I keep of uh, slide rules. This is the name that's actually on the rule. This is the material that it's made of, and you'll see this one is magnesium and this one is magnesium. The scales on the front are listed in this column and the scales on the back are listed in this column. And as you will notice with uh, and ex with one exception, which is this one, I think, and this one, I have two exceptions. These are duplex rules. In other words, they, there's a cursor that reads on the back side. Uh, this one and this one are not, uh, I'm sorry, this one and this one do not have scales on the back, so there's no need for a cursor. There are a couple of specialty rules in here. One is the uh, this rule and this one. These were specialty uh, electronics rules. Pickett made a lot of specialty rules. This one was made for the Cleveland Institute of Electronics and this for the Capital Radio Engineering Institute. They used to uh, give these rules or, or provide these rules as part of correspondence courses for electronics. So uh, we'll look at those, not in this video, but perhaps in a future video when we look at specialty slide rules. So let's get down to the slide rules themselves. Here is the model 800 and the model N1010T. Now later in its life, the picket company used the T to refer to the white or nearly white, off-white color of these rules. They also had an ES, which they referred to as an eye saver, yellow color. Also, because there's an N in front of this, you know it's one of the later rules. Whereas this rule, which is the model 1000, is called an orthophase duplex, and that's actually one of the very early rules. It's made from magnesium, as you can tell from the corrosion on the uh, top here. The, the cursor has a groove, or the, the track for the cursor is grooved. That's not true of these aluminum rules. The aluminum rules just ran on aluminum. Notice how the aluminum stays uh, shiny. Uh, and this is a, an almost all plastic cursor. They still used metal screws, but the uh, but the cursor itself is is plastic. 
whereas the early rules had these metal cursors with uh, plastic inserts. Now they actually did use a glass cursor very early on, so let's take a look at that and then we'll kind of go through the, uh, the sequence of development. This is a Picket Model 3, and you'll notice, you can tell from the glare, that the uh, that this is a glass cursor, uh, glass on both sides. It's an early one, it's a Model 1, or a Model 3, I'm sorry. There were a sequence of rules that Picket uh, developed in the 40s. One of the first was the Model 1, quickly replaced by the Model 2, which lasted for a couple more years, and then the Model 3, and that's this one. This is the Model 3, and you notice that they call it a DESA multi-phase log-log rule. Log-log because it has scales over here for uh, logarithms of, uh, that is, e to the uh, power 0 to 1 and e to the power 1 up. Uh, so basically plus uh, e to the plus x and e to the minus x. This particular rule, you'll notice, does not have a full complement of scales on the slide on the back. Instead, they have these things called decimal locators. On the front is where most of, well, all of the trigonometric scales are, plus at the top are some cube root scales and some uh, square root scales down here. Two square root scales, three cube root scales, along with the traditional folded scales, C and D, the inverted scales like CI and DI, uh, and so on. So this was considered a fairly advanced rule when it first came out. Now after the Model 1, they produced the Model 2 and 3, and then the Model 4. This is the Model 4, the Model 4T, and you notice that it has in parentheses vector hyperbolic. That means that they added, now you, you may also notice that the, the scales are quite a bit different on this one than the, than the Model 3 but many of the scales are the same. But there are two new scales that a lot of the rest of them are just rearranged, but there is a TH, which stands for hyperbolic tangent, and an SH, which stands for hyperbolic sine. And we won't talk about those here, but maybe in a future video we'll look into hyperbolic functions on slide rules. By the way, I should point out that here you can tell this is the original color of this slide rule, but uh, because it was underneath this and was obviously exposed to light for quite a while, perhaps also a smoker's environment. At any rate, this color is the, uh, the color now, but this is the color it probably was when it came out of the factory. So I point that out because it really wasn't intended to be quite this, this uh, yellow. This one was, and even more so, the N4T, which is this one, was definitely intended to because it, ha it says it's an N4ES, uh, which means eye saver. Now you'll notice that it has many of the same scales. One of the neat, uh, neat additions is the color, that is the addition not, not of the yellow, but of red scales. And you'll notice that they retain the hyperbolic functions. Let's look at some of the other rules. Here is another magnesium rule from the early period. 
This is a Model 600. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Let me make sure. No, it's Model 800. Model 800, and notice it's magnesium. Here they are starting to put log-log scales on these, even though these were the very early magnesium rules. Here is an aluminum. In this case, this is a specialty rule done for the Cleveland Institute of Electronics. And at the end here you may see it says electronic model N515T, I think. And notice this is not really a duplex rule. On the back, even though it has a cursor, the cursor is used for doing things like determining the magnitude of impedances and things of that sort. This is the duplex trig. This is an N902T and the this was one of the first, the 902 was one of the first to have this double T scale that you see here with T and S uh, sort of back to back down this, uh, down this line here. The uh, picket used uh, a photo process to put their scales on and one reason you do need to be careful when you're collecting a uh, picket rules is like in this one there might be a temptation to go in here and try and remove a lot of this because some of it I'm sure is just nicotine and, and dirt and uh, and also some surface uh, color discoloration but if you go in here and try to remove this you're going to wipe away the scales as well so be careful with picket rules the scales are a little more fragile than the rules that have engraved scales. Now I just showed you a specialty rule. The This one is one that was made for the Capital Radio Engineering Institute and it also is a uh, specialty rule that has impedance and so on and like I say we'll talk about that perhaps in a future video. This is the N531 ES for EI Saver. Pickett made a lot of these specialty rules in fact in their catalog they even told you how to uh, who to contact at the factory if you wanted something even just promotional rules or things of that sort. This one was a rather special picket rule. It's called the high log log. It's the N500. Uh, and once again ES. And the high log log was the first rule that I know of that picket made that had a relatively complete set of log log uh, scales. In other words, scales that went down to the small enough numbers and up to the high enough numbers that it was really useful in engineering. <clears throat> I earlier talked about this rule. It's one of the early uh, magnesiums. This is the Model 1000. It's called the Orthophase Duplex. And uh, duplex, as I've said before in some earlier videos, simply means that there are scales and cursors on both sides of the rule. The, uh, as you may uh, see in the uh, K&E uh, video, that was originally invented by a K&E consultant and they patented it and used it for a very long time. Eventually the patent expired and other companies could make duplex rules. So uh, this is the last rule I'm going to show you, which is the 1010T, and it's called the trig rule. And one reason that I want to do that is I wanted to show you first some of the manuals that came with these. This was the, the picket manual. Let me zoom out a little on that that came with that trig N1000 or, or yes N1000 
And notice it says how to use trig slide rules, and I apologize for the glare. The later, when they developed log log, they published this manual, how to use log log slide rules. I uh, want to point out the manuals especially so that you'll know what to look for. Now all of these manuals in electronic form, PDF, can be downloaded from the International Slide Rule Museum, but it really is kind of nice to have the manual yourself. This is the dual base log log manual, and there is a difference. If you try to use this manual, you will not really know how to use the dual base slide rules, and I've showed you three uh, dual base slide rules that uh, uh, basically all of the wide format log log rules were dual base. So be sure you use this manual whether you use whether you get yourself a copy or you use the copy online. Picket often also produced supplements like this one about using the, the natural log and the logarithm scales. There were special pamphlets, for example, for the Cleveland Institute of Electronics and uh, Capital Radio Institute on how to use the special scales on those rules, but we'll talk about those at a future time. So let me close by showing you a few of the ways that these were packaged. The uh, most picket slide rules came in a box very much like this. And then the, the, the more expensive ones would come with uh, nice leather holsters. That's an example of one. Here is another picket holster. And notice the, uh, it slips into that, uh, that flap there. And finally, they produced, as I showed you earlier, some uh, fairly nice holsters for their specialty slide rules. This is the one for the Cleveland Institute of Electronics. So I haven't been trying to show you the technical details of these slide rules, more a kind of historical overview in part because this, this series is intended to be more of a retrospective, of uh, a kind of nostalgic look back. But if there are areas that uh, people are interested in knowing more about how to use slide rules, I suggest two things. One is put some comments, and I will certainly consider doing something along those lines. Uh, but in the meantime, what you might want to do is go over to Professor Herning's website and look at some of his more detailed videos of exactly how you use these slide rules. Before I wrap up this video, I did want to uh, make mention of something that I had talked about in a previous video. I had always heard that picket slide rules were taken aboard the Apollo missions. Uh, some people talk about Neil Armstrong taking one, others about Buzz Aldrin. Uh, there's a the website from the National Air and Space Museum that talks about one that's in the National Air and Space Museum. But if you go over to RF Cafe, which I have found to, to be a pretty good website, and by the way, if you're interested in the instruction book for that Cleveland Institute of Electronics slide rule, this is a good place to find it. They have it uh, on there, but you notice that right here is the Great Picket Slide Rule Apollo Conundrum. And I'm going to slide on down here a ways to this article, which talks about which slide rule really went aboard Apollo. And it turns out that no one can really confirm that a picket slide rule went aboard the Apollo missions. So originally I had actually, before I did this video, considered doing the uh, getting a, an N600ES, which is the alleged perpetrator, uh, that somebody was supposed to have taken aboard some Apollo mission, 
But it turns out that uh, while the astronauts certainly owned Pickett's flight rules, and NASA used them a lot, there's no real evidence, apparently, that one was ever taken aboard the Apollo mission. Uh, they were used a lot to cross-check the antiquated computers of the day to make sure that uh, things like fuel burns and so on were were correct. Maybe some people could have used those when they uh, used uh, modern computers to build the Hubble tape, uh, Space Telescope and they forgot that inches and centimeters are not the same thing and apparently they blended two databases, one in centimeters and one in inches and that's the reason why I understand that they had to do many spacewalks later to try to fix all the problems with the Hubble. It could have been fixed if somebody with a slide rule had simply said, wait a minute, that's not right. So anyway, uh, I just thought you might like to see that this is actually a controversy. So I hope you've enjoyed this particular uh, Pickett retrospective. Uh, as I uh, like to say, look forward to some more. And in the meantime, have a nice day.